Hello my loves and welcome to another episode of History. I've stopped counting episode numbers now uh, because I decided to go back and rename all of my episodes um, to give you a bit of an idea of what each episode is about. So instead of just like episode 26, Hedy Lamar, I think it's 26, I don't know. Um, it's like Hedy Lamar. Um, Hollywood actress, bombshell, mother of Wi-Fi, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we're not doing episode numbers anymore. Um, or if you want them back, like, let me know. But, um, just thought it was easier not to do them. So today we are talking about Mary Frith, <laughs> Mary Frith or Mole Cut Purse, as, uh, as she was known, Thief. Madam, actress, cross-dresser, and highwaywoman of 17th century London. Born 18... Sorry. It's going to be one of those days. Born 1584-85 in the Barbican in London to a shoemaker uh, and a housewife, Ron and Catherine Stewart. Little is known about her early years, except she was a tomboy and a bit of a hooligan. Can relate. Mary's uncle, who was a minister, once attempted to reform her during her childhood by sending her to New England on a ship. Like, her parents got so fed up of her, they were like, just put her on a boat and send her to America. We can't deal anymore. Uh, however, she jumped overboard before the ship set sail and refused to speak to or go near her uncle ever again. And after this, she joined a gang of pickpockets and left her family. I don't think I'd speak to my uncle ever again either if he tried to pack me off to America. Mary presented herself in public in a doublet and baggy breeches, smoked a pipe and swore a lot. Again, can relate. She was recorded as having been burned on her hand four times, which was a common punishment for theft. She was a one-time sentence to do penance. That's my dog. Honey, stop flapping your ears. She's got an ear infection, bless her. Um, no boo boo. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, she was a one time sentence to do penance standing in a white sheet at St. Paul's Cross during a Sunday morning sermon. Uh, it had very little effect since she continued to wear men's clothes. Good. Her house, on the other hand, was said to be surprisingly feminine and she had three full time female maids, so that might have been something to do with it. Uh, she had mirrors all over it to admire her clothing. She kept parrots and bred mastiffs as well. Her dogs were very special to her, with each having their own bed with proper sheets and blankets, and she prepared their food herself. Aww. It's believed her career as a fence and pickpocket began to gain notoriety in 1600, around the age of 15, when she was indicted in Middlesex for stealing two shillings and 11 pence on the 26th of August 1600. After that, she became a prominent local figure, and in the following years, two plays were written about her. The first was the 1610 The Mad Pranks of Mary Moll of the Bankside by John Day, the text of which, unfortunately, has been lost. Um, the second, which survived, yay, came a year later and was called The Roaring Girl by Thomas Middleton and Thomas Decker. Both plays dwell on her scandalous behaviour, especially of her dressing in men's clothing. The Roaring Girl also shows her as someone who attacks a male character for assuming all women to be prostitutes. I like the sound of this play. Mary seems to have demanded a lot of freedom in a time where women who acted unconventionally were frowned on by society. In 1611, she even performed in men's clothing at the Fortune Theatre. On stage, she bantered with the audience and sang songs while playing the lute. The banter and songs were somewhat obscene, and by merely performing in public, she was defying, defying a societal convention. This public action led to some reprisal. She was arrested on the 25th of December, Christmas Day, 1611, and accused of being involved in prostitution. That seems to be what they accuse everyone of. On the 9th of February 1612, she was forced to do penance for her evil living at St Paul's Cross. She must hate that place. According to a letter by John Cumberland to Dudley Carlton, she put on quite the performance. She wept bitterly and seemed very penitent, but it is since doubted she was maudlin. <laughs> she was 
It is since doubted she was maudlin drunk being discovered to have tippled a third of sack. Oh, bless her. On the 23rd of March, 1614, Mary married Luke and Markham. However, the marriage was little more than a clever charade contracted to give Mary a comeback when suits against her referred to her as a spinster. By the 1920s, Mary was most certainly working as a fence and a pimp. She procured young women for men, but also respectable male lovers for middle-class wives too. Stop shaking your head, boo-boo. What -boo. poorly ear. Um, there was one case where a wife confessed on her deathbed to infidelity with lovers that Mary had procured. Mary then convinced the lovers to send money for the children that were probably theirs. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I love it. Women who dressed in men's clothes at the time were generally considered to be sexually riotous and uncontrolled, but Mary herself claimed to be totally uninterested in sex whatsoever. On the 21st of June, 1644, Mary is recorded as being released from Bethlehem Hospital after being cured of insanity. It's a bit bizarre, this. I'll go into this a bit more later, but um, it seems to sort of come from nowhere. Um, this may be related to a story that she robbed General Fairfax and shot him in the arm during the English Civil War, and in order to escape the gallows and Newgate prison, she paid a £2,000 bribe and agreed to a stint in Bethlehem. Mary died of dropsy on the 26th of July, 1659, on Fleet Street in London. Now it's time for fun facts about Mole Cutpurse. Pseudonyms. She had quite a few. Mole Cutpurse, Mal Cutpurse, Tom Falconer. Maybe that was her boy name. I don't know. Mole was a common name in the 16th and 17th century for women of disreputable character. And Cutpurse means thief. Um, because people used to have their purses tied to their um, clothing via strings. So you would cut the strings and take the purse. There you go. Um, the Roaring Girl is from the Roaring Boys, which were aggressive young men of lower social stations who defied codes of civility and aped the courtly dress styles of the upper class. A showman named William Banks once bet Mary £20 that she wouldn't ride a horse from Charing Cross to Shoreditch dressed as a man. Hello, that's what she does, right? She dresses as a man. Not only did she win the bet, she rode waving a banner and blowing a trumpet. Uh, <laughs> she rode a famous performing horse called Morocco. And this scene is featured in Shakespeare's Love's Labour's Lost. Mary has been regarded as the first female smoker of England. Smoking a pipe was seen as something that only men did at the time. Smoking and cross-dressing were essential to her image and character. Um, Mary enjoyed the attention that it drew and she enjoyed causing a scene and making people feel uncomfortable. After her arrest in 1612 and a stint in Bridewell, she was examined by the Bishop of London and gave a confession on January the 27th, 1612, which was printed in the Consistory of London Correction Book, a record of cases where offences against religion and morality were tried. Mary admitted to flaunting her male attire, blaspheming and swearing, being a drunkard and keeping lewd and dissolute company, but she denied being a prostitute. Bless her. I like Mary. Mary's style and character made her an object of suspicion, attracting both fascination and revulsion from the public and condemnation from the courts. Uh, she was an enigma, and because much of the historical material relating to her life is fragmented, embellished, or even invented, and certainly prejudiced, she's become a somewhat mythical figure. But I have tried to find the facts here, people. We're here for facts. By 1614, Mary had built up quite the little business at her London house on Fleet Street. Thieves would bring her stolen goods, which she would then buy off of them. Those who had been robbed would actually come to Mole's house in search of their own possessions and buy them back if she had them. Um, sounds a bit weird, but this was actually easier than going through the courts at the time. Court was a laborious process. You had to pay for it yourself. You had to pay for your own representation. Um, yeah, it, w it was a mess. Um... British crime and justice in general 
has been a bit of a mess over the years. Um, even right up until the late Victorian era, I think you had to pay for your own prosecutions. So this was probably a cheaper way of doing it and getting your stuff back as well. Um, so her husband, Luke Namarkham, was not mentioned in her will and they never lived together. During one court case, Mary could not remember how long they'd been married. She ran her business completely independently. Being married meant she was able to defeat legal suits against her under her maiden name and she used her married status as a shield from the law. They never had any children. Apparently, she had a natural abhorrence to children. Many contemporary biographies were written about Mole. She even wrote uh, an autobiography herself. The Newgate Calendar of 1662 described her, above all breeding and instruction, delighted only in boys' play, not minding or companying with girls. She was not to be tamed or taken from her rude inclinations. She could not endure that sedentary, sedentary life of sewing and stitching, wishing her needle, bodkin and thimble changed to a sword and dagger for a bout at cudgels. John Milton wrote the epitaph on her gravestone at St Bride's Churchyard, Fleet Street. Engraved on her marble headstone was, For no communion she had, nor sorted with the good or bad, that when the world should be calcined and the mixed mass of humankind shall separate by their melting fire she'll stand alone and none come nigh her i hope i've said that right i can't read my own writing today uh, her gravestone was unfortunately destroyed in the great fire of london um <laughs> so it's not there for us to see today um one of the possible myths um not sure if this is true i couldn't i couldn't find like a factual um, basis behind this it was in the Newgate calendar but um again I don't know if it's true was she asked to be buried face down bearing her backside to the world as a last defiant gesture which if that's true we stand so, highway woman um so when I when I googled Mole Cutpurse it came up with highway woman and then when I read about her life I was like where is the highway woman bit so i had to do quite a bit of digging to find this but the newgate calendar states she committed a great many highway robberies but all of them on roundheads or rebels against king charles the first in the civil war so she was a royalist she she was a thief with morals um it was doing this she robbed general fairfax on hounslow heath shooting him in the arm and killing two of his servants horses Close pursuit was made of her and she was apprehended at Turnham Green and they carried her to Newgate where she bought her pardon for £2,000. After this, she gave up highway robbery and opened a pub. And this is supposedly where she uh, spends her stint in Bethlehem. So she agrees to pay £2,000 and stay in Bethlehem for a while and then she's miraculously cured of her insanity and allowed to go home when her time is up. Um... So lastly, last fact about Mole Cutpurse, her neighbours called her a hermaphrodite. Her sexuality kept everyone guessing. She dabbled in picking pockets, selling stolen goods, porn brokering, pimping out men to middle class women, fortune telling. Uh, she owned a pub for a bit, highway robbery, as well as acting, singing, playing the lute, fighting, smoking and drinking heavily. She sparred as well with her wit and words as she did with her swords. Both followers and critics couldn't help being drawn to her intense and magnetic character. She had an amazing sense of humour and loved to play practical jokes on people. Her friends and followers mourned her passing and her legend lives on to this day. Her memory gradually making the transition from public menace to fondly remembered folk hero. So there you go, that is the story of Mole Cutpurse or Mary Frith. Um, I love her, I love the sound of her, I love the fact that she wore what she wanted, she did what she wanted, she smoked. Um, you know, was she struggling with her sexuality? I don't really think that matters. Um, I, I, as with, you know, Anne Lister and, and Marsha Johnson and other people that we've covered in this series, I don't really think that matters. I don't really think that that defines them as a person. I think their actions define them as a person. And um, the fact that she wasn't interested in sex at all um, and had a natural abhorrence to children, um, maybe she was. Maybe she was. Maybe she did feel like she was born in the wrong body. But um, 
I don't really think it matters. Uh, I think she sounds like an awesome human being and I would have loved to have been around uh, when she was causing absolute havoc. She just sounds like a complete rebel and um, that's what I like about her. So hopefully you've enjoyed <clears throat> today's episode on Mole Cup Pest. Join us again next time for another episode of History. Uh, please do give us a like, give this video a like if you've enjoyed it. Please do subscribe uh, to the channel. Check us out on Facebook and uh, Instagram with the History Girls on both. And uh, yeah, let me know in the comments below who you would like me to do an episode of History on. And I will see you all again soon. Mwah. Goodbye.